Roberto, thank you very much for your time, for accepting my invitation to have a conversation. This is mm -hmm. part of a series titled Breakfast at Kuznach. So, conversation with lecturers, Jungians, that studied here, that teach here, so that the students and the community can take advantage of this conversation. We are in the Punktzima, which is the room where usually students have exams. And uh, as far as I understand, this room is very familiar to you because next year will be 40 years that you have graduated at the Institute. So 2018 is an important day. Yes. What is your memory of the Institute? Oh, let me start right here and now. Uh, you told me the interview would be here, but now that I am sitting here, it's impossible not to remember that in 81, so this is 35 years ago, when I, I was doing my final exams, Dr. Helmut Bartz was sitting here. He was the uh, president of the Curatorium, and the observer was Dr. Heinrich Fürz, who was then my analyst. And he was, had been analyzed by Jung himself, founder of the Zürichberg Clinic, and the exam was on psychiatry. Now, that's a good start. First of all, the Jung Institute is the only, was and still is, the only place in the world where people like me could have a second chance. Because I studied law and social sciences. I entered the university in 63 when I was 18 years old in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Why law? Because my father, uh, being a middle class man, he thought his son should be a lawyer or a medical doctor or an engineer. And as since I was a boy, I had it was very easy for me to talk in public. Then my, my father said, well, he'll be a good lawyer. And I went to law school to please my father, or because it was the father's word. But I never found myself in the law school. And I chose to study social sciences. And I loved uh, sociology, history, anthropology, political science, and so on. And then I thought I would be a teacher and a scholar, an intellectual. I went to the United States to do graduate work. But when I was 30 something, I had a horrible depression, a painful depression. And I could not go on because I did no longer believe in what I was teaching. I mean, how could I teach? Machiavelli and Hobbes and Rousseau and Montesquieu and all that, when Brazil was under a military dictatorship and I was in a personal crisis and I said, it's not honest, I cannot teach. So I had a leave of absence and I wanted to do analysis. In the United States, in the 60s, I had done because I was already a little depressed. I had done group therapy, which was fashionable then. It was the, the home of Carl Rogers, Rogerio therapy, and I did that, which did not help. A little psychodrama. And I began, together with my uh, political scientists, I began to read Freud. So I bought the paperback edition of the main books by Freud and I was very interested in them, especially the case, stories, Dora. And I said, I also must analyze my dreams. And as I was doing research for my thesis, I had this metal box with cards for my research and I had a second one in which I would write my dreams. And I read Freud and then I went to my dreams and I tried to analyze my dreams. And my dreams were very heavy. 
I remember I had a dream that I was in a jury and all the patriarchs were there in the jury and I was being condemned by the patriarchy. My goodness. And then I read further, I read further, I go to my files and my cards and but then I realized that it it's as if all dreams were like Dora's dreams. And it was a kind of repetition. And I said, should I when I was depressed and back to Brazil, should I go to a psychoanalyst? But I had found a book in a bookstore in the United States because the cover of the book caught my attention. It was this old man and it was dreams, uh, memories, dreams and reflections and I bought the book in uh, 71 and I began to read it and then I said no this is not Dora, this is not Freud. I think this man would understand what I am living. So I searched for a Jungian analyst, but in Sao Paulo there were only three. And I went to one of them. And in the course of analysis, after two years I think, one day I had an insight that since I was a boy I was interested in talking to other people people about their most intimate sufferings and my fantasy was that I could share that and somehow explain to people why they suffered. I remember vividly these were fantasies I had and then I also remember that when I was a teacher uh, when you are a, a university teacher, besides uh, giving classes and doing research and publishing, etc., you have to have free hours for the students who might want to come to you, and then you, in, in the door, you say, from three to five. And all my colleagues took that very lightly, and when students came, they would go have a coffee and talk about football or politics or whatever. This I remember during analysis, but then a student came and said, uh, Gambini, uh, for this uh, paper uh, you had a reading list and I went to the library and I couldn't find the material. And I said, you could, you could not find the material in the library? He said, no, it's difficult. Then I said, is this really what you want to talk about? And then the student said, uh, can I tell you something? I said, go ahead. And he said, I took 40 times LSD and I don't know what's real, what's not real. So I am in your class and I listen to you, but there are two realities and I don't know what to do. And I felt, I am a teacher. I have to take care of the whole of the student. It's not Machiavelli or Hobbes. This young man is telling me something very serious. Uh, and then I, I tried to talk to him about two realities and saying, well, but you have to stick to one. And the other was because of LSD. Uh, and, then, and then he said, can I come back next week? I said, yes, you can come back in the same hour. And he went there several times, and the other was uh, another student. I can't find the material in the library. I said, no, it must be something else. And then he said, Gambini, I'm terrified. Uh, this was 72. I am a homosexual, and if my father finds out, he will kill me. And I think it's better that I kill myself, because I don't know what to do. And then I went into that, and then the girl, she was pregnant, and then the other. I had forgotten all that. In analysis, 
I had this moment saying, perhaps that's the real me. I'm not a teacher of political science. I'm not a member of the intelligentsia. I'm, I like to think. I like the intellect. I like to reflect. But this is not a profession for me. It must be something else. And I was talking to my analyst and then he said, you should go to Zurich. And then I got some information how it would be and I wrote a letter to this institute telling my story. And I had already a project of research and I was accepted together with my wife who had studied social service, had worked with women in jails, had worked with poor people and she also had this drive to work with people and we both were accepted and in those years there was a numerous clausus here they would only accept a certain number of foreign students but we were accepted and then I had to fight fight to get a scholarship in Brazil to be able to come and move to Switzerland and and everybody thought it was very strange saying Gambini but you belong to the university, what are you doing there? And this scholarship, which was an official governmental scholarship, they would not give scholarships, uh, they would only give to someone who would go to a university or to a scientific institution. And they said, but this Jung Institute is not a university. I said, no, it's not, but it has a higher level of, of teaching, but you are going to change profession, we don't support people who want to change profession. So it was hard. But two advisors who examined my quest, they supported it. They were like angels, I don't know who they were. So I came and um, in this place, I could make a decision that I would try to become what I am. And the Jung Institute offered me the knowledge to work as a Jungian therapist, offered me the opportunity to do analysis with Hilde Binswanger, was from the Binswanger family, but she herself was a Jungian. Fields was very close to Jung, and he told me, I am working with you the way Jung worked with me. And he was not orthodox at all. And he was the one who made it clear to me that to be a Jungian meant to find the stone on which I was standing that I needed something solid to stand on and that would be my standpoint, my attitude to look at the world, to look at reality, to look at the psyche, to look at society, to look at life, at human beings from the Jungian perspective. And also, I went to Marius from France to be my advisor and I did supervision with Adolf Guggenbühl Craig, who also was one of his kind, and uh, Mario Jacobi, and Mathilde Pope, and all the seminars and lectures were those old people who brought first-hand experiences. Some were very orthodox, some were more open to other ideas. So the institute was plural and I had the freedom to find my own way. Also, Brazil is an extroverted country. I am an introvert, but Brazil is extroverted and Zurich is introverted. And I, my, my two children were born here we didn't have money, so in the night, in the evenings, 
we stayed home. <laughs> a coffee was too expensive. And then I read the whole collected works and all the books I had to read and listened to music and, and wrote. And uh, never again in life I had this chance to turn inward and be quiet and, and have time to digest. I have all my books underlined and if I go back to them I still see, you know, the lines, pencil, because it was so important there to really read and understand and, and integrate. I knew it was a golden opportunity in my life. And, and I was very quick. I think I am one of the students of this institute who could finish the program. I did it in three years and eight months without skipping anything and without um, uh, bluffing. It was all hard work, but I could do it. And now I go back to the beginning. And in 35 years ago, I was sitting where you are, being examined in psychiatry. I'm not even a psychologist. And Bartz was sitting here and Firtz was sitting there. And do you think I don't have an emotion now? Is the emotion of being an inheritor, of being a continuator, of having received a legacy, which is the term I would use to my generation, because there is the first generation of Jungians, I don't know if it's the second or the third, but clearly I am 73 now. Uh, I have inherited and this creates a responsibility and a keen consciousness what we have to keep alive is the spirit that emanated from Jung and everybody else and even the place the flame my great fear is that legacy be understood as academic production. Academic production has a place, but it's not all. One way to keep the legacy alive is the way we practice, but most of all is the way we live. Uh, not a Jungian life. Jung never said to people, don't he never said, imitate me, as he said, no imitatio Christi. We should not imitate Christ, we should not imitate you, we have to find our own life. But we, all of us, we need mentors, we need somebody who's a, 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 a grand reference, human reference to us. I have chosen Jung. So, Jung did not teach anyone how to think, nor how to live, nor how to work. But he gave us tools of how to conduct our life, our outside life, our inner life. How to use these tools to make something with them. It's like a carpenter. You must learn the skill to use the hammer and the saw and the screwdriver and wood if you are a carpenter. Tools. To me, Jungian concepts and Jungian theory is a good box of tools. Very, very practical and, and very helpful and necessary. There are other toolboxes. Good, wonderful. I have mine. It was not a gift. I had to make a sacrifice to deserve it. It's good that I did. But it was transmitted to me. I didn't buy it. I receive it as I receive the house where I live from my father. So in this institute I received as an inheritance a box of tools. And um, I exercise my hand at them every day. That's why I say, to be an analyst, it's not a profession. 
It's like the passion an artist has for his or her art or a craftsman has for his craft. There must be a passion for the material, for the tools and the thing you work on. I work with people, I work with human material and I must exercise the way my hand holds the tools. I cannot copy that. So, Guggenbühl, Fiertz, von Franz, Binswanger, Jacobi, each had their way and I had to have mine. As if I tried with them, but I don't work as they did. I had to find out my way. And to me, this is uh, invaluable. Because in a new university, you don't get that. You have to be a disciple of somebody and then you belong to the followers of that theoretician, right? Until the day you split. I, I had this freedom to, to be myself. Universities don't give you that. They ask you to comply and to, to acquire the knowledge they think you should acquire. Here, nobody told me this is the limitation of the knowledge that you have to acquire. It was absolutely open. In the same way it was open to Jung. Jung had a very wide access to knowledge. He loved knowledge and he could uh, uh, thinking together with a biologist or a geologist or an archaeologist or a physician and looking at the layers of the earth. He could understand the layers of the unconscious or the preservation of life for an insect would be the same attitude towards life as we have. And that fascinated me that all knowledge has roots that spring from the same object which is called life. But Reason has separated knowledge into departments and this has become officialized. But in this place here, which is not a university, it's not a college, it's not a school, you had this surreal curriculum that one day somebody was talking about uh, a 12th century Chinese tale and then you study psychiatry in the 19th century and then uh, psychosomatics and then alchemy and then neurotic behavior all together and you could go wherever you wanted to go from that. So. The Jung Institute is not Harvard, it's not Sorbonne, it's not, that's not the, the mark of the, the mark of the Institute is that it is unique and that Jung did not want it. This is also very interesting. Jung was against the foundation of an institute. He did not want a psychology branded Jungian psychology, but his disciples convinced him, but I think they were right. If not, neither of us would be here. But I understand what he meant. Also when he said he didn't want anybody to become a Jungian. Um, so, uh, you invited me for this conversation in this room and I am fully aware that I am trying to continue 
the growth of a tree, uh, like we, we are branching out this tree, but it must remain the same tree. There should be no hybridization, I don't know if you say that, you know, hybrid, when you mix apples with bananas. Uh, there's no need to do that. What Jung thought, because he had access through his introverted, intuitive thinking, he had access to a zone or a channel that he uh, uh, baptized as the psychoid, in which he he had an almost agnostic perception of certain levels of reality which he tried to formulate in scientific terms so it could be uh, readable and also not confused with uh, science fiction or mysticism but one, he did not write everything that he thought. And second, even what is written is not completely understood to date. So, it is necessary not that we try to be post-Jungians, because to be post-Jungian still you have this reference to the father, you want to overcome the father. I don't have that problem. I don't need to kill the father or to overcome or reformulate. I inherited my father's house, I didn't put it down. You know what I did with it? Some friends said, oh, you could introduce modern art. It's a 1941 house that my father designed. And they said, oh, we can put a glass structure here. And I said, no, I took off the plaster to show the bricks. I took off 70 years of paint to see the wood. I said, let's take out the mask and this is the house. My father did and his son took the mask. So, I, I, with Jung, there's no need to create new concepts kind of trying to say oh he didn't understand it properly or we must update this con I think all oh, this comes from um, this kind of problem there's no need to change the concepts we just need to learn how to use them and go forward. When Jung said in the Unus Mundus, matter and psyche are one, or inner and outer are two sides of the same coin, it's easy to say it, but still there is a lot of ground to be covered not so much with a sophisticated intellectualization of it, but to experience it. Again, the word selbst, self, in my country in Brazil, there was an attempt to translate it, and then it was translated by si mesmo which doesn't make sense, is oneself, more or less. And then we say self, as we have many English words. The word doesn't matter. We call it self, you can call it self. What matters is that you experience it. And you, you don't become an, an extraterrestrial if you, if you experience it. It only means that you know what you are talking about. And what he said is that the self 
is a, a, the center that organizes not only the psyche, it organizes our perception of reality, our consciousness. And that there is a, a relation between the ego and that center. Okay, this is the theory. We must live it. And we must practice that in analysis. So this other level has to manifest, and it does. Uh, but it's not like that. You, you have to follow a line to reach that. I, I'm very aware of the passing of life, of time in my life. I am, my life didn't change much externally, but I remember time and what it did with these things that I'm talking about. So, being Jungian helps to grow old. Not because you have a recipe, but because you have a consciousness of what you were before and in what direction you are heading. And that, that makes it very interesting because it's like a process of learning. And uh, I want to stop now, but uh, to close up, uh, I would say the Jung Institute went through a crisis. I didn't follow it too close. I was in Brazil and the crisis was happening here. And I was shocked when I saw the people in this community were projecting their shadows on each other and there were power struggles and there were attacks that hurt people on both sides. I was so far away and I was very sad. And I, of course I did not participate. I belong to the Swiss society, but this is just a formality because I don't speak German. So I never come to the meetings, I don't vote. And uh, I am grateful to the Swiss society because in Brazil, uh, officially, I could not belong to a society because I'm not a psychologist nor a psychiatrist. Although the first society, I must say, they changed their rules to include somebody like me who, even not being a psychologist nor a psychiatrist, nevertheless, or notwithstanding, is a member of IAAP. Because it would be a scandal if they would not include me. But I don't fit there. So I'm a member of the Swiss society. But I was very shocked and very sad with what happened. And I, I feared that the institute might close. Fortunately, it hasn't. Things have changed. Now there is the system of block, is that the name, isn't it? Which is the only way people can come from abroad. It's impossible today to do what I did back in the 70s. Uh, you close your office or you, uh, you, uh, you leave everything behind and come. Uh, and if you have a family, I mean, this is impossible. So, it makes it possible for people to come, but it's quite different. There is not that that uh, being in it for a, a period of time. But things change. I mean, I can understand that. And hopefully, the institute is alive. I am here because I try to bring my personal contribution with the things that I'm doing. I'm giving lectures and I'm not teaching anything. I just want to inspire and give a testimony. This is what I want to do here. Your experience is enlightening for many reasons. You've been through memories, reflections, mm -hmm. and I would like to talk about dreams. But before I share with you the fact that in the middle of my life, like you, I left my profession to follow what I thought was a vocation that I had when I was 18 and I repressed 
for three times. The third time I said I should follow it. And I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a psychiatrist. So I didn't know that. Mm. I am touched by this because, because it's a big difficulty to work as a psychoanalyst without the accreditation as a psychologist. Because you have to feel legitimate inside and mm. where this legitimation comes from. As I mentioned in my workshop, to me it came uh, through a dream. If you want, I can tell uh, the dream. But it is difficult to... Uh, and even. You know the etymology of the word vocation? In Latin it is vocare, to call. I am called vocatus sum. I have been summoned. But you must hear who, who says that. Because if you say, I have been summoned, who is this I? Because I also didn't hear it. My father said, you are summoned, you are vocatus to be a lawyer. And I heard a voice in me, in, uh, summoning me to be an intellectual. It was a partial, because I can be an intellectual. I mean, if I think I am an intellectual, I did not sacrifice the intellect. But this calling, uh, well, it came when I was 30-something. Maybe that's the way things are. But the drama is when somebody hears a call and there's nowhere to go. So the call dies in the air and then it's a pain because you cannot. Either because you are too old or you are too poor or there are no schools or places where you can learn what you need to learn or do what you want to do. This is a drama in many people's lives in a country so unequal as, unequal as Brazil is. So many vocation people cannot become anything because they are poor and they have no opportunities. This is another question. But here we had the opportunity to hear the call. What are dreams? Dreams are thoughts that I have when I am asleep. They spring from the same place where my thoughts now spring forth. The difference is that those thoughts are not directed by my conscious ego, but they are my thoughts. I think about the world, my dreams think about the world. I think about myself, my dreams think about myself. I think about my difficulties and my conflicts, my dreams do too. So they are my... The, my dreams are the thoughts of my twin brother, who is me, but is not the me who is awakened. And I think it was a great formulation by Jung, the dreams are not merely the expression of my wishes or that I could uh, discover my repressed wishes. Dreams are much more than that because they are as much as my thoughts are. I can have sublime thoughts or I can have stupid thoughts and I can have sublime dreams, and I can have also very commonsensical dreams. And Jung said, dreams want to take part in your conscious process, so they can also be part of your life. So it is a, a goal, a, a target, uh, that we should try to take them into account to create an inner dialogue between two thinkers, my waking conscious mind and my mind when I'm not in the ego. And these two are like two people in a dialogue. And mostly they disagree. If this one goes too high up, this one puts him 
down here. If this one is afraid, this one is courageous. If this one is blind, this other one sees things. And this one has another angle of vision. So, when I look at myself, I look from an angle, which is the angle of my consciousness. But my consciousness is very similar to my eyesight. It comes to, uh, here to here. It's not even 180 degrees, it's a little less. And I can only see things, even if I turn my head, it will always be this, right? This is my angle. My dreams look at the same things, but from another angle. So, if I look inside, consciously, I can only see what is in the scope of this prism. Now, my dreams look from another angle, which is not the, the ego's angle. So, dreams can see other things from another perspective. Something, sometimes they see from the back or from below and things that are hidden. So, if I take dreams into account, I enlarge my scope to consider whatever has to be considered. So they add to consciousness. And this has nothing to do with repressed wishes. Dreams can talk about wishes, why not? I think about my wishes, my desires. I think about them and I know that some I must be frustrated because I cannot have all the pleasures I want or all the this or that. This is okay, this is normal. And dreams also sometimes remind me of desires, pleasures, or wishes, or things. When to me that's part of, of my mind's contents. Sometimes I, I, I can't accept because I, am, I feel guilty and then I don't accept, or I have a complex and I don't accept. And then dreams speak clearly. To me, there's no problem there. The thing is, do we understand dreams? And then, oh, you have to learn how to interpret. And then there's come this greed. Give me the key, give me the secret code. I promise I won't tell anybody. I go to the Jung Institute and I will have the key like a code in the war. The, the, the spies of the secret code. This is shadowy. Uh, but it happens, and then I think, uh, what does it mean when you dream of this and that and the other? What is a, a spider dream, a tooth dream, a death dream? Oh, now I know. And then you inflate because you think you have the. Uh, this is all stupid. No. Now I, I don't even say to interpret a dream, I say to transliterate a dream. If we connect with the dream, we say exactly what the dream is saying. Transliterating, this is not translating, because in transliter, there is the word letter. You even change the alphabet. And also, the language of dreams is not linguistic because it has words and images as one thing, right? When the discourse that narrates a dream is supposed to convey to you an image, but not with another image. I don't tell you my dream my dreams, drawing them. I can draw a dream, but I speak. I was in a landscape and a giraffe appeared and then this and the other. I am using words to convey images because dreams are visual. What comes first, image or word? There is a theoretical dispute, like Lacan 
would say the word comes first. Jung would say the image. They are one. The language of dreams is word image. This is the only language with this attribute. So you cannot translate it, you can translate Chinese. But the language of dreams cannot be translated because it would be exactly the same thing, ununderstandable. My crazy dream in Portuguese would be a crazy dream in Japanese. In order for you to understand, I will use words. Words that convey the same image that is in the dream, but now you understand the image which is not explaining the symbolic meaning of a lion. Perhaps in your lion dream, instead of lion, you tell me, you, you dreamt that there was a lion hidden below your bed and you were afraid. And then I can say, in your dream you are afraid of your strength. I did not translate the dream. I'm saying the same thing in a way that you can understand. But to do that, I had to come to the Jung Institute and then to work myself years and years and years. Because Stefano, I am this way. I love the intellect, but I fight with the intellect. I don't like the intellect to be the king. And I don't like people who want to be the big person because he's intellectual. Especially when this is a sign of superiority because uh, lower people will not understand you. You know, intellect should not be at the service of power. So I have a, 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 I have a, a, a fighting position. How do we reflect? How do we use our thinking function? Everything that I think about, I think with passion. And I take sides. I'm not neutral. I cannot do mediation. I am not neutral. I take sides. I am against evil. I am against lying. I am against fake ideas, pseudo-ideas. And then again, uh, Jung uh, helped, me helped me understand the functions here, how important it is, how good it is if the intellect comes hand, hand by hand with arrows. If intuition comes together with scientific knowledge, if reason is a lover of art, uh, so these are things that you have to um, embody. One thing is to talk about that, the other thing is to embody. And to me, individuation is to embody what I talk about. You know that saying, do what I say, but don't do what I do? No. I can only say what I do and I have to do what I say. I have to become what I say. I would be a charlatan if I would tell a patient to individuate if I do not myself. But again, what, it is, what is it to individuate? Which is one of those catchwords. I don't need to change the word. I have to understand it. And what it means is that you have to become in your flesh 
in your actions, in your deeds. You have to materialize your psyche. They have to become one. And it's difficult. And you, you need courage and you pay a price for it. Sometimes you go against the, the, the stream. You can be criticized and you can be judged. And, and you also need to find a standpoint towards that. But to me, this is my religion, I would say. To incarnate. I cannot incarnate God. I'm not the Son of God. What can I incarnate? This more profound level. If it exists, it must come to the surface and it must act in the world. Which does not mean that we should become activists or write pamphlets or manifestos. It's enough if I do it quiet in my corner. Because we need a growing number of people who try to do that. This is one of the things the world needs. We don't have to write another book on ethics. We have to practice it. And again, the tools. One of the tools you gave us is called shadow. And the other tool is called projection. Projection of the shadow. Oh, you have 10 years of work with that. Why do we lie? How, how do we search for truth? What is, what is this? in a person's life. When you speak of anima and animus, again, I don't like the theory, and then discussing if women have anima and men have animus and post anima and, and this and that. I don't need that. I need to experience what that is. It is an experience. I know what it is to be possessed by a negative anima or by an inspiring anima. I know there is something that intermediates me and something deeper in me, but I don't care the name. There is an intermediation. Sometimes it's closed. Sometimes I feel I am superficial. Sometimes I feel I am uninspired and I say, oh, I'm so sorry, but the door is closed. I, I, I'm not accessing. We are variable. But those tools, they are there for us, first of all, to work on ourselves. And then we work with the clients, the patients. We use the tools to understand the world we live in, or the subjects we choose to make a study and, and say something about whatever. I have my topics. One is trees, the mutilation of trees in cities, for instance, or other things that I have worked on. But then, um, what was I saying? Yes, to embody. To me, individuation is to be uh, to become what I say. When we talk about individuation, or when we talk about the concept of the self, mm -hmm. becoming oneself, in Italian there is a beautiful expression, farsi se. It's a beautiful translation. We cannot forget what Jung said. Deo concedente. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is God, Roberto? God is a name. Unfortunately, in our religions, they were made in such a way that we are children forever. Because, first of all, we project a human being in God. In the Christian or Jew, Jewish Christian God, we project 
an old man, a man and not a woman, an old man. We anthropomorphize God and this creates enormous problems. God is not a human being, God is not a man or a woman. God is a name. In Judaism you don't even pronounce the name. I don't care, it's a name. But there is something that receives the name God. There is something. And this also you should experience. Deo concedente you should experience God. It depends on your openness and it depends on your paying attention. Because it can be minimal, it can be very small. But that's up to you. You need the uh, perception. And then, what is it? It's something that transcends my consciousness. Before I lectured this morning, I was sitting in the garden here at the Institute in a bench. I reviewed my imagination, how I would start the lecture. It comes in my imagination. You would say, this is the anima. Yes, I think it is the anima. I imagine a few minutes before and then I go to the stage and it happens. I've done it hundreds, hundreds of times. It's, it's um, very pleasurable. But after I had reviewed these uh, topics, I said, well, let me empty my mind. And a good way, I have done meditation for years, but I, I did not meditate there. I did something which is recommended and is very practical. Concentrate on your breathing. And I was sitting there, the, today was a beautiful morning, very quiet, and I was concentrating on my breathing. And then I thought, while I inhale oxygen, my blood circulates, and I don't know exactly how, and in the heart there are two chambers, and in one blood comes in, receives oxygen, and the other blood leaves out carbon, and this goes on and on. And right in this moment I am breathing, and this fantastic mechanism is taking place inside of me, which is a a circulation, I'm alive. And then I distracted myself and began to think about something silly. And then I said, no, let me go back to that. I was into what? Right now I am breathing and the leaves in the trees through photosynthesis, they are also absorbing oxygen and, and leaving out uh, uh, carbon and and this is the miracle of life, and I am not conscious of it. We breathe all the time, and we do not pay attention what is happening and keeping us alive. You know that if you go that way, you might slowly transcend, which is the goal of all the gurus and the meditation and all that. I mean, you, all of a sudden, you know what is there. This is wonderful. And we live such a poor life because we forget to pay attention. So, God, Jung said that to him, religion, the religious attitude was careful attention to the manifestation of something that is greater than the ego. Like in a synchronicity, in a small thing that happens. And when he said in that BBC interview, Freeman abruptly changed his subject, abruptly, to catch you in the flight. Dr. Yu, do you believe in God? Believe? 
I don't need to believe. I know. And it was a scandal. Well, in English, to know has two meanings, but how dare you say he knows God and then all the theologians and all that. Blah, 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 blah. But I think he was being sincere. I mean, he had had experiences of this that he called something greater than the ego. But he was careful when he uh, wrote about God. First of all, because of his father. He began when he was a boy. And then some people say, for you, God is the unconscious, is the same thing. God image, uh, God within. And then we are lost in words again. But of course when you said God, he was not referring to God, the church God, or the anthropomorphized God. And I have been searching for that since I was a boy. I remember, I think I was six years old, and I was sitting in the backyard, and I was thinking, what is infinite? This was 1950. It was before Sputnik and all that. But there was Julius Verne. And then I said, well, if I am in a very quick flying rocket, and if I go, 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 if, I nev if it never ends, this is terrible. But also, if it ends in front of a wall, this is terrible too. So I said, infinite, it's an awesome thing. And then I tried eternal, and it was also terrible when I thought of eternal. And then I went to my mother, I asked her what was infinite, and she said, why don't you go play with your toys or something like that? So, I had been searching for these uh, um, illuminations since I was a boy. But here at the Institute I didn't have any illumination and I didn't have any uh, active imagination that led me to those realms. Nothing magical. It happened later, after Jung. Ah, I tell you this, Stephanie. I'd like one day, I don't know if I'm able, here in this institute, to talk about three great men. I don't know if they are the same stature, but I. One is Jung, the other is Krishnamurti. I think it's wonderful if you, if you put the two together. Because Krishna Murti knew what the mind is, what thoughts, thoughts are, what emotions are, and how they blind us. He was a great, great man. And the other, he's not so spectacular, but I love him, Oliver Sacks. His passion for chemistry and physics and, and neurology. And when I put the three together, there you have knowledge, which is um, a tool. Knowledge is not an end in itself. It is a possibility to overcome our stupidity. And, uh, and make room for us to be overwhelmed by reality to the incredible power of life to create life. When I think Darwin, I could put Darwin there too, but when you think of the evolution, is I don't enter this dispute, you know, creationism versus live that, but look at life, it's, it, it's so, it's so enchanting, you, you become marveled, I want to become marveled with human beings, 
although I am so disappointed. But I can also be marveled what can happen with people, uh, with the heart, with the sensibility, with the creativity. And uh, this, yeah, this goes back to uh, knowledge about the unknowable without hubris. It's not forbidden, it's unknowable until you know it. Uh, and if we are balanced and mature and are not in, a, in an inflation, we can at least consider things that are not in the books. And this is pure Jung. This freedom to have a myth of the meaning of, of life. A myth of eternity or and endlessness. I, I don't find it anywhere else. And all this can be channeled into a very simple thing which is called therapy. Because it only needs two people. You can sit in the bench and do it. Therapy is a kind of conversation. That's all. You don't need anything. You need two people. But one, if it's a therapist, must know something. And then you do it, and it must be as old as mankind. And in that very simple thing, which is a conversation, all of a sudden, something enormous can come in. And, and I think it's beautiful. And this is what we try to cultivate in this place. And uh, I see that there are many young people attracted to it and the flame is, is, is alive. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to hear you. It's a great opportunity in this room in which I was examined. I'm afraid I was not to be approved. <laughs> Who approves us?